What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Gustavo from Verify, which was recently acquired by Bull Bitcoin. And it is an amazing, uh, well, consultancy firm for peers to become self-sovereign in their custody of their magical cyberspace money, Bitcoin. And that goes, of course, hand in hand with the non-custodial and privacy-preserving Bull Bitcoin exchange. Uh, that is now really teaming up to become this massive powerhouse of sovereign Bitcoin onboarding uh, in Canada, uh, it, which very much needs it, especially in these days. Uh, so I'm excited to sit down with Gustavo and talk about all the good things uh, that he's been working on and why he's so motivated to do the work that he does. Uh, but before we get into it, of course, this is a community-funded podcast, so get a Podcasting 2.0 compatible wallet at newpodcastingapp.com, uh, where you can toss not just this podcast, but a bunch of other awesome Bitcoin podcasts, some sats for the valuable content that is out there. Uh, and thanks goes to Saxonet for the edit, Jaeger for the artwork. And Ubuntu for the timestamps and all the other cool people working on this uh, show that we deliver to you. And without any further ado, Gustavo, how are you? Hi, Max. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. How are you? Well, I'm I'm really excited to uh, follow up a bit on on the awesome uh, Bitcoin Montreal conference that you're currently organizing, uh, and m m maybe. As, as a lead off into the conversation, why are you doing all this work that you do? Why do you focus so much time and attention on to proliferating Bitcoin technology? So I, I guess it's a bit of both. It's both my passion for Bitcoin and for just freedom, uh, particularly at this moment in time when it's so crucial. We're seeing so many attacks from, uh, from people that, that don't like freedom, don't like privacy. So, so it's so important to work on that right now. But also because I just love hanging out with Bitcoiners, you know. It's it's so fun. Uh, it's the best time I have. So uh, it just combines my two passions, you know, talking to, to, to my friends and, and, and people that think like me and work on privacy and freedom tools uh, to, to better up the world, particularly in this crucial moment. So, yeah, both of that. Yeah, it's good to have some curation for the, the tribe of the peers that you hang out with. And Bitcoin seems to be a nice um, base layer <laughs> on many levels, uh, including reputation and interest based. Uh, it really seems like that hanging out with Bitcoiners is just naturally fun. Yeah, of course, particularly this moment in time, you know, when so many people feel alone, uh, so many Bitcoiners feel like uh, they're, they're, they're alone in their cities. They, they're talking to their families, to their friends, and nobody understands them. Uh, and they've come from many parts of the world. Some some have come from California, uh, Ontario. So, uh, like, they flocked, uh, uh, took it, took, taken planes to come here. And now we're all meeting together. And everybody's very thankful. We would say, like, hey, I was feeling alone. Uh, and now it's so cool to see that so many people think like me. Uh, so, so, yeah, it's it's really great. Yeah, awesome to rally under a common uh, cause, and, and that is Bitcoin. Right? So, so when did you get into free software, and what fascinates you about the topic? So, to be honest, I got into when I was very young. Uh, that was uh, 2015. I was uh, 18 years old. Uh, I honestly, I just wanted to make some money <laughs> uh, at first, but it, it quickly became just a fascination. Uh, at, at the same time, the world was changing, you know, throughout all these years. So it just became clearer and clearer uh, what what I had to do, you know, what that I had to to work on this, that I had to to make it understandable for for just peers to to use it and uh, and and fight the the good fight, you know. Uh, and since it's uh, since 2017, I'd say I, I've gone full time into this. Uh, Very five, we founded it uh, in 2019 after. Uh, a mining startup that didn't really succeed because of multiple reasons, but one of them being government uh, coercion and government mandates against free markets. But anyways, we founded Verify with the mission of educating individuals and just sharing our expertise uh, to get most people on self-custody. That's really what our focus is, the adoption of self-custody. And, uh, you know, over the last year and a half, the, the need has been clear. The market has also moved to our direction. Uh, we now have people like Jack Dorsey working on hardware wallets. 
and promoting them so so it's very clear that there's a need and and that people are seeing it our way nowadays you know in the crypto anarchist uh, or in the cypherpunks manifesto it, it says that cypherpunks write code and then that's pretty different to cypherpunks go out and educate and then i was always curious about the difference between working on building the tools themselves which is of course you know the fundamental prerequisite but then going out and teaching people how to use these tools properly how how do you think that that trade off comes in that's very interesting well i to be honest i have a background in software too so so i have been writing some tools uh for for like as a cypherpunk but uh i i'm not uh, the most qualified uh, software engineer so i could be waiting i could be spending uh, in like just investing my time in like developing tools and catching up but i'm also very good at vulgarizing and you know communicating and socializing with uh with other individuals so uh and so are my my co-founders and and my friends so we just told ourselves like hey uh there was this clear community in montreal when we started uh bitcoin montreal uh, actually started uh in 2013 if i'm not mistaken it started with the bitcoin embassy which was a physical location in montreal downtown where bitcoiners would meet ever since 2013 but um the people that were running that uh, physical location and the, and the meetups they don't have so much time uh, at that moment to handle it uh, so so and we were up and coming we had a lot of time uh, we had a lot of drive so we just took on that mission to keep that community alive so for us it was mostly about maintaining a community that had already been established uh, so it, it wasn't about you know looking for new people there were always new people coming to us and asking us questions and we also just noticed at that moment um the all the breakthroughs that were happening on bitcoin and a lot of people being focused on shit coins and, and just useless technologies that pretend to, to to be private pretend to to be free to represent freedom but fall fall short to that and we we maybe maybe the reason why we understood that it's because we came from a similar background we also got distracted at some point with altcoins and other technologies that have little purpose so we understood uh, that you could make that bridge that you could go- come from that side and end up uh, on the right side so we took on that mission uh, because we it had been our path as well so uh, ever since uh, ever since starting that yes we've increased our team yes we've developed you know some some a web application uh, websites some web tools but uh we've educated tens uh hundreds of of individuals uh into you know acquiring their self custody setups acquiring their coins using wasabi uh and it has been very fruitful as experience you know uh and that's what this week was all about you know doing it uh f- closing the summer of uh, of Montreal that's very short in Canada but Uh, to do it in a in a very uh, energetic way and uh, putting uh, taking putting everyone together and tomorrow is like the the ultimate stage of that of this week tomorrow is the biggest bitcoin barbecue in the world there's already 220 people that are going to attend the barbecue and it's free so uh, we're going to talk a lot about bitcoin and about the stuff tomorrow and yeah, that's that's really sounds great and I I think you know one aspect is to to write the software and to create numerous options to for individuals to choose what to use but ultimately you need to know uh, or you need to be able to rank order all these options and find the most suitable for your needs and that is again education right to learn about all the options out there and make good decisions on which one to use and as you said right with without much guidance you can easily get down the shitcoin rabbit hole uh, and it's a lot of fun down there so you might get caught uh, but if there are some experienced bitcoin veterans who who have lived the bitcoin rabbit hole for a while that are there to uh, shorten the the discovery path so to say uh, towards bitcoin and and provide good resources uh, on uh, how to look at the subject properly that's very useful and can potentially get a lot more people interested in the space and providing meaningful contributions 
Yeah, totally. And you know, for us, it wasn't so. Uh, it was initially that we, we thought that we would we could get like just regular cryptocurrency users or just regular people into sovereign tools, uh, and that sometimes felt short uh, and didn't work out completely because a lot of these uh, a lot of individuals out there. Uh, they don't see the clear need for it. At least they didn't see the clear need for these tools a couple of years ago. But many did, and, and many have joined on to the mission in, in our community in Montreal. Many people that were just watching our talks three years ago have now launched podcasts in French, are now educating to, uh, are, are, have now turned their careers in, into software development of these type of tools. So it's not only about like getting users into the, the right tools, but getting other, you know, content creators uh, or the software developers into the community to eventually uh, capture more users. Uh, that has been part of the experience uh, too. And uh, just ever since, uh, you know, COVID happened and the lockdowns happened, now the, 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 the message is clear. Now people are, are understanding why was that? Why run a node? Why? Uh, use a multi sig like when when it, the the need is clear uh, when you you have to live through uh, some some form of tyrannical governance uh, that impacts your everyday life you you really understand why you would need these tools so uh, and and this has been the clear difference between this week's conference and the last years of educational efforts we've done now I can really say to people like hey if you're not running a node. Good luck uh, over the next couple of years because the, the, the need is clear. Yeah, it really is. And it's great to see that there is now so much education already out there and continues to be there uh, to guide users down towards a self-sovereign path. You know, and teaching the teachers, that's the true multi-level marketing scheme going on in, in the Bitcoin space. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's kind of like that, you know, it's not multi-level, but... The incentives are, are there, you know, for us to do that and at the same, you know, make a business out of it uh, and, and be profitable. And it's, the incentives are there for for more content creators or, or software developers to join the mission. So it's about following the incentives um, with the right principles uh, and eventually things fall on, on the right place, you know, uh, and that's what we, we're really seeing. And I really, M Montreal is really a nice city, at least uh, geographically and, and culturally um, until now, uh, but but it has a very strong community of Bitcoiners. You know, when people ask my ask me often, like, where else is there like good communities like this? And I think there are a few in the U.S. like uh, Austin, Miami, Denver, uh, but and maybe a few in Europe or in uh, Latin America. But Montreal is really clear uh, as as a defining community of, of Bitcoin maximalism and, and just, uh, you know, um, freedom preserving and privacy preserving tools. Uh, so, so it's really be fun to be part of that. Yeah, that's true. And nice how these pockets of liberty end up being developed by the individuals on the ground. So I wonder with Verify, do you even go into the why of Bitcoin uh, or do you just assume that that's already there and you jump into the how straight away? That's a very good question. So in our experience, it has differed. Uh, some people understood the why. So actually, some people were, had already listened to, to a bunch of content uh, that, let's say, Stefan Levera has produced or you had produced uh, or just uh, or Marty Ben had produced, like known podcasts, known articles. They had already understood the why. They had already understood uh, like what they should use uh, but they just didn't know how. And that's a type of customer that comes to us is like, hey, uh, I want a multi sig or I want to know. I understand why I want it, uh, but I need some help. Uh, and, and also, like, they, can f they could physically, at that moment at least, come to see us. And, and this week as well, they can physically see us. We can talk. We can build that human trust and relationship that usually uh, it's hard to do online. Uh, so that was a, a clear component of that. Obviously, we don't like they don't share their keys with us, their private data uh, with us. We we don't want to know uh, any of that private information. You know, uh, and we just educate them to to develop these tools. But a lot of people also 
uh, ask us the why. And uh, we, uh, I'd say it's a little bit less uh, of the people that um, have get directly through our security support. Uh, it's more the people that want to get into Bitcoin because we also can buy and sell Bitcoin. Uh, and and both Bitcoin does that too. Uh, so a lot of people get on the the why in, in that sense, uh, and but they they usually come from uh, most recently they come from like one of the uh, of the talking points. You know, it's either like ah oh, I've heard about inflation. Uh, is is it going to be a thing? Because it seems like it is. Or I heard uh, the the Federal Reserve is printing a lot of money. What's going to happen when that happens? You know. Um, so, so we try to, so, so it's usually people that have, a, 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 they, they're close to understanding the problem that Bitcoin fixes. Uh, and it becomes much easier for us to then uh, go and, and, and tell them why Bitcoin and how Bitcoin, you know, uh, rather than, ha but obviously there's always people that just want to make money and have seen Bitcoin price go up on the news and they want to get some. Uh, and to be honest, we don't, uh, we, we try to, to, to explain to them why, but sometimes people will, will come around eventually, you know, uh, maybe it's not their moment and over time they will, uh, come around. I, that's at the end, I just trust the process, you know, of everyone getting to Bitcoin for, uh, real incentives. And, uh, that's why we're not that pushy, you know, it's like, okay, you don't, you don't want to like you don't want to buy bitcoin you don't uh you don't want to to you don't believe in in inflation or things like that uh it's cool we'll uh, we'll talk when you'll be ready uh, and eventually everyone will in, in my opinion yeah bitcoin explains itself uh, eventually and and people come to understand it sooner or later uh, hopefully you know if not then well have fun staying poor, I guess, is the, is the only attitude left. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, unfortunately, it is like that, but we'll see. Uh, more, more often than not, people do understand it and people do want to, to proceed. Yeah, I think so too. And then people really who, who have the curiosity and, and the drive to look and actually and honestly try to discover truth, well, then Bitcoin is, is quite obvious and pretty you know common sense uh, at least the basics of it of course if if you're like uh, if you're now if you have your eyes open on on what the world is like and what's happening in the world uh you you have to understand bitcoin i would have a hard time uh not understanding bitcoin right now at, at this moment i cannot unlearn bitcoin you know uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah good, good luck trying to fall out of the rabbit hole uh, and, and forgetting it that's that's tough <laughs> <laughs> exactly you know and uh, that and a lot of people ask me sometimes like why are you like what makes you more bullish uh, on bitcoin by the day is it the development that's happening and sometimes they tell them like you know like bitcoin could be zero developed or like few things could change but just it's it's about the problem that Bitcoin fixes, and it's about how the, the, the world moves rather than how Bitcoin moves. Um, and that's that's really it, you know, and the world will keep on moving, will keep going in one direction, and, and Bitcoin will keep being there as a solution. Uh, so, so it's not, it's, it's about just, you could, you could, I could ignore Bitcoin, I could ignore the price, and I could just, you know, talk to people about regular stuff, and uh, by that, just realize that the value Bitcoin proposes, you know. So I wonder, how do you even get paid for these type of consulting services? What's your financial model behind it? Right. So we have a few financial models. So the, the first one, the simple one is uh, people go on our website uh, and they click on uh, the security section of the website. They read on uh, the, the different basics, concepts, uh, and ways they can self-custody. Uh, and they can uh, either purchase some time from us. Uh, we sell uh, our one-hour supports for self-Bitcoin custody uh, and uh, verification. So let's say they're running a node uh, or they're just uh, installing a cold, cold card and they need some help, well, they can just purchase our time uh, one hour at a time. 
and we can uh, jump on a call and help them out. Uh, it's it's possible to do it in person as well, but uh, it, that requires coordination to be in the, in the same physical place. It's, it's not always so so clear. Uh, but the most popular uh, versions of our consulting is um, hardware plus uh, installation support. So either they need a cold card or, or they need three cold cards for a multi-sig. Uh, we ship the cold cards uh, either from our facilities or directly from the manufacturer if, uh, uh, if, if that's what, what comes over to it. Uh, and then we just help them through the installation support without receiving any piece of secret information that would you know, compromise their setup. Um, and uh, basically teach them the best security practices. Uh, but we have one of the, mo the, the most advanced form of plan we have is uh, called the Fortress. Uh, and the Fortress is basically a cold card multi-sig uh, with metal seat plate backups uh, with a full Bitcoin node. Sometimes it even includes like a Wasabi session, you know, where we're going to teach them about how to use Wasabi. And that's really for people that, that want to get full covered. You know, they want their no, they want more to say. That's usually the customer that has listened to a lot of podcasts, has knows a lot of the information on the why and almost on the how. Or like he knows what he has to get. He just doesn't know. He just needs some hand holding. And that's what we're here for. So they can purchase that on our website as well. Uh, pay with credit card or Bitcoin. Uh, preferred what, Bitcoin. What, what, wait, 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 wait. What? You you, you take shit coins? That's 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 dangerous. Yeah, I know it's dangerous, but it's not everyone that's uh, that wants to pay with Bitcoin, you know. So it's uh, it's unfortunately that's the way we have to operate with them now. And in, in the best scenario, we we only take Bitcoin, uh, but unfortunately, that's just the way that the, the market is right now, you know. Um, you never take shit coins, can you like fiat shit coins for any of your services? Well, no, no, not for my real ones. Sometimes I do provide the service uh, of uh, offering my precious sats in exchange for shit coins, but for for real labor and goods, uh, there, no. Well, you're lucky, yeah, because it's it's not a, it's not for yet available for everyone. Uh, yeah. But you see, as, as long as long as you take all of that fiat Funko Pass and get rid of them instantly at Bull Bitcoin, I guess you're all set. Yeah, Bull Bitcoin definitely has uh, offers that use case for us. Uh, it can allow us to to get rid of the uh, our shit coins for Bitcoin uh, instantly, and uh, yeah. to pay our bills with Bitcoin as well, so we don't have to use a bank account or anything like that. Yeah, Bull Bitcoin really is one of those best uh, shitcoin disposal facilities, uh, and mainly because it's Bitcoin only and built by cypherpunks that actually know what they're doing. <laughs> so uh, I, I think let's go a bit down the, the feature list because it's quite impressive and, and I don't think we've covered it on the pod so far. So what's kind of your basic pitch for why Bull Bitcoin is as awesome as it is? Right. So my basic pitch is, first of all, it's a non-custodial privacy preserving uh, immediate delivery service for, for buying Bitcoin. So, uh, and you can buy Bitcoin on the, the just regular Bitcoin, but you can also buy it on the liquid network uh, directly to your wallet. Uh, and very soon you will be able to buy it from the Lightning Network. Uh, and you'll be able to use uh, a Bolt 11 invoice to receive the, the Bitcoin over Lightning, or you're also gonna be able to use a LN URL um, structure payment uh, that allows you to, to get the Bitcoin received to you. So that's on, on the purchase side. Every Bitcoin that's sent to the user is, uh, is mixed uh, in, in advance uh, so that it's blockchain analysts and, and people that third parties that would like to like uh, understand the, the behavior of, of, of the coins would not be able to. So the, the transaction is between bull Bitcoin and the user only. Uh, and what's very interesting as well is that you can do DCA, so dollar cost averaging, uh, and on an hourly basis. It's, it's one of the few services that allows you to do every two hours or every hour or, or every day. Uh, and I actually, that's one of the ways I, I purchase the most is I like 
set it up for a couple of days, every hour, uh, and, and I purchased it like that. And it's all delivered uh, immediately to your wallet. Well, not immediately because it's batched. It, it takes like one hour, two hours, uh, but it's batched immediately. So it's, it's, it's on queue. And you just receive it when uh, it goes on the Bitcoin network. So both Bitcoin leverages batching to, as well uh, and Segwit Native to have the lowest fees. But even then, we pay the transaction fees when we send Bitcoin to the customer. Uh, but we just make it inexpensive for us or at least the least expensive through batching and Segwit. So those are like kind of all the features we have on the purchase side. Yeah, let's dive down a bit deeper into the transaction batcher because that's really a genius thing. So RBF and the mempool is pretty crazy, uh, if, but I mean, especially because it's that crazy and that untrusted, we can do some cool chicanery with it. Uh, but please explain, like, how, how does Bull Bitcoin use the, the batcher as a high-frequency Bitcoin transaction maker? Sure. So everything is done through CypherNode. Uh, CypherNode is kind of like the, the back end of the back end of Bull Bitcoin. Uh, so obviously you go on Bull Bitcoin, you see the front end application, you can uh, create an account, uh, buy Bitcoin, uh, enter an address to receive it, things like that. That goes all on the, on the back end server of Bull Bitcoin. Um, just to see, let's say, does uh, the user have uh, a cat Canadian balance? Uh, has he verified his email? You know, just regular website, web application type of stuff. Uh, but once, you know, it passes all the checks, uh, let's say the user has enough Canadian dollar liquidity to purchase Bitcoin. Uh, well, that request is then sent to CypherNode. Uh, and CypherNode is basically an API that uh, abstracts uh, every microservice. So Bitcoin Core, Liquid Core, uh, Lightning, Sea Lightning, Wasabi, everything is abstracted uh, behind an API and a proxy. So the request goes to to CypherNode that uh, we want to receive, a user wants to receive this amount of coins uh, to this address uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, and that was like initially just CypherNode by itself. And you can use CypherNode by itself like that. However, now there's an addition which is called a Cypher app. Uh, because every uh, application that backend application that we've developed or even front end application that we've open source uh, that leverages cipher node or that complements cipher node is what we call a cipher app so the batcher cipher app is an api on top of the cipher node uh, system uh, that just simplifies in, uh, the it, it, that's basically just batching uh, everything and, and let's say it has different uh, thresholds or different schedules uh, that you can modify and by the way this is all open source code anybody can go and download cypher node and a little batcher and use it for their system uh, so batcher um, the way we use it if i recall correctly it's uh, every uh, two hours or uh, every time it reaches one big so what it means is that uh, if, like, let's say we every there's 10 customers that make requests, like I explained earlier, that go to the batcher, and these 10 customers together, uh, on the ninth UTXO, on the ninth customer, it goes over one Bitcoin and, and 100 million Satoshis, well, that's the moment uh, we're just going to push the transaction on the network, and it's going to get uh, dispatched and sent to the users, you know? Or it's going to execute every two hours, whichever comes first. So that's just how the batcher works. It allows anyone running it to decide uh, the threshold on when will the, the transactions be sent and broadcasted to the, to the network. And there's a webhook uh, notification that comes with it for those that are, let's say, uh, more, more on the software development side. That means it's going to get give a response back to the, each individual client so each individual user is going to tell them, hey, by the way, uh, we've sent the batch. Or it's before it sends the batch, we can, there's a response that's going to say, like, hey, we've gotten your request to batch funds. Uh, it's going to take either an hour. Well, it's going to take max an hour and 45 minutes, let's say. 
or and yeah really that's how it works yeah, that's fascinating and of course transaction batching leads to a lot of less individual transactions and therefore less blockchain usage usage and lower mining fees uh, which is always great but i wonder do you do you also use replace by fee we also use replace by fee uh, we use replace by fee when uh, when there's a there's a difference between uh, the real well this estimate smart fee by bitcoin core uh, that when we create the transaction we we estimate a fee uh, with like a, a confirmation target, but you know, things change. Uh, the mempool can get filled very quickly and uh, your, your estimation fails or comes short to it. Uh, and that's when we use RBF. So we would use it manually. You know, we don't have like uh, automatic functions that use RBF. It's usually when we're realizing like, hey, this transaction is taken is unconfirmed and it's been a couple hours. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it happens. Uh, and that's when we use RBF to push the, the transaction further. However, um, if the transaction has too many uh, children, um, there it's, it becomes u difficult to use RBF. I think there's a limit to... You cannot use RBF if your transaction has uh, more than 25 children, something like that. Uh, and if it has happened to us in the past that we weren't able to use RBF, uh, but I might be mistaken on, on the exact uh, reason why. Yeah, one of the cool things with Art, uh, RBF is that it can also replace entire transactions, hence the name, and batch them together. So you have a first transaction paying Alice and Bob, and then you have a second transaction paying Charlie and David. And then if both of them are still unconfirmed, and if both of them are seemingly paying too low fees, then you can replace both of these transactions with a single transaction, spending some of the same coins of each transaction and creating the four, of the four addresses to Alice, Bob, Charlie, and David, as well as the change back to the, the exchange. Uh, and with this second transaction, even though you're going to pay a higher a nominal, uh, like a higher uh, relative fee rate in sats per VByte, uh, because it needs to be replaceable, you will probably pay, uh, uh, you will for sure have less block space uh, and and therefore also pay less sats in total, uh, even though you get a much higher fee rate. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't know about that. So you, you can combine multiple transactions when you RBF. That's really interesting. Yeah, the only downside to that kind of is that uh, the receiver will receive a second transaction that is broadcasted through the Bitcoin network and that will replace the coins that he has received in the previous transaction that is still unconfirmed. And so he will need to handle that, uh, uh, that double spending attempt gracefully. Uh, and good wallets like Wasabi uh, do that, which by the way was a pain in the ass to implement. Um, but uh, that might be some issues, especially on the UX and with some additional confusion. Right, of course, but that can all be communicated between between with the user. So, so it, it's possible to, or, or it can maybe manage with a good wallet like WhatsApp. So, so it's fixable. But of course, it, there's it's not it doesn't come fully perfect. Yeah, and that's also the other thing with uh, you know having low fees for such a service and therefore long confirmation times is kind of annoying because ultimately the Bitcoin are only settled and received when they are confirmed multiple times in chain. But the longer you wait in the mempool uh, with a low fee before you get included in the block, the longer the potential time where the exchange might double spend. Uh, and therefore, the in, in some sense, the custodial risk is, is still is there for all that time, right? So driving a low fee strategy might not be as optimal. That's true. That you you're very right on that. You know, and it's very hard to define what's custodial and and what's not. I, I guess the, the the definition would be when when there's still counterparty risk, it it technically is still custodial in, in a way. Um, and and that's why we try to you know not be too cheap on fees. It 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 has happened in our history at Bull Bitcoin that we've paid too much in fees, uh, particularly around the. I wasn't around at that at that time in Bull Bitcoin, but I've been told. 
2017, 2018 years. Uh, a lot of transaction fees. But, you know, one uh, after experience and trial and error, and, you know, when you, you lose real sets, uh and through these uh through these problems that's when you come up with uh, with an optimized system you know uh that handles everything correctly and that you know doesn't take too long to 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 get funds to users or uses rbf manually has a batching system you know and and that's what we have nowadays you know it's it's very optimized uh users are very happy with it so uh we're, we're in a pretty sweet spot in in that uh, in that sense Oh, I very much agree that on for the on-chain layer, you've really gotten a lot of efficiency out already. Uh, and and still, of course, right, there are the natural limitations of the base layer. Uh, and yet still, with second layer tech, uh, you're solving that pretty nicely. And that is, of course, already implemented liquid Bitcoin. And soon coming in two weeks, <laughs> the Lightning Network, uh, that will lead in liquid to two-minute settlement time and with Lightning, or well, basically instantly. Um, so that's that's really exciting, of course. Exactly, you know. And uh, Liquid's been a while with Bitcoin has had it, and Lightning actually yesterday, um, Etienne, who's known as Kex Key on Twitter uh, and online, he's a uh, like the Cyphernal, the main developer, and uh, kind of the 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 with Francis Polio, the CEO of Bitcoin, the the creator behind it. Um, he did a talk at our conference yesterday in Montreal where he explained how we've implemented uh, Lightning Network on Bull Bitcoin in a very technical manner. Uh, and that's going to be available. That's available on YouTube uh, on the Bull Bitcoin channel, which has all the live streams of, of each day. Uh, anyways, he did a demo of the Lightning feature on Bull Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, at least some people got to see it yesterday uh, here in person or on the live stream, uh, how it worked. And the demo was very successful. So it seems like uh, it's not that far away well, that we'll release Lightning, uh, which will allow instant settlement with our users. So what's the magic? How does it work? So once again, it leverages uh, Cypernode. So Cypernode has had uh, it, it deploys C Lightning uh, as it deploys a bunch of other microservices uh, and it exposes uh, everything through the same API. Uh, so really when you're talking to Cypherdome uh, and, and you make a request regarding Lightning on Bitcoin, there's not a lot of difference from, uh, from the API side. Like it, it's all abstracted under the same API. So... Uh, there's this way to do it with just Cypherdome uh, that with Bolt 11. So, so, so that's just a classic um, Lightning transaction. You know, when you you uh, you go on Bull Bitcoin, you say I want to buy for like uh, let's say a uh, hundred thousand Sats, uh, which payment network Lightning network? You click on Create by Bitcoin Order, and it tells you uh, enter your Bolt 11 invoice. So. That's really how Lightning has worked so far, uh, and there's really no surprise there. If you're used to using Lightning, you enter Bolt 11 that you can get from. Any wallet can produce that, um, and that's it. Uh, Cypherdome uh, gets called with like uh, Lightning Pay, uh, just like pay this invoice, uh, pay pay this LN invoice. I think that's the call, uh, and it pays the the LN invoice. Cypherdome just does that automatically. Uh, with C Lightning, obviously we we have we have to have channel management for that and and, and things like that on our side. Uh, but what's really cool and what I'd say the, the the real magic is the LN URL implementation. So we haven't open sourced that yet uh, since we haven't launched Lightning yet. But we will open source it at the same time we we launch the feature. And basically, uh, Kexki from Bull Bitcoin. He has written his own LN URL server-side implementation. Uh, so he's really going through the protocol and uh, written in TypeScript, uh, which is a, a, a new programming language from a couple of years ago that it's basically JavaScript, but everything is typed, so it's, it's more secure. Um, and, and it just has better developing experience. Anyways, Kexi has written his LN URL 
server-side implementation uh, that's complementary to Cypher Node. So it's going to be like a Cypher app, like the patcher. There's going to be LN URL server. And uh, the LN URL voucher, you just scan it with uh, most popular Lightning wallets. I think the most popular would be um, Blue Wallet or uh, Phoenix. They, uh, Phoenix has really done a, a good uh, LN URL uh, user experience from what I've seen. And you just scan the, the voucher and boom, the transaction is executed instantly uh, through LN URL. You don't need, the user doesn't need to have any, to enter any input uh, because he just needs to scan a QR code. Uh, that's how LN URL works. So yeah, that's really the magic and uh, instantly the transaction gets sent and uh, the user gets it sent. Yeah, LN URL is, is magic with the scanning a QR code in order to receive SAS. Uh, that really was a great idea and the UX is, is stellar. Uh, it, it really couldn't be any simpler. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's uh, maybe over time, it's not going to be that useful because, you know, there's a lot of changes to the Lightning protocol with like Bolt 12 uh, or uh, I, I know some people, uh, AMP have said they, this it might fix it. I'm not too familiar with it, though. Uh, but I know there's a lot of changes on the on the Lightning protocol. Um, so maybe over time, LNURL won't be needed since uh, a lot of the reason why it existed uh, will, will, will just get, will have, there's going to be new additions to the protocol and uh, the problem it solves won't be that much there. But for now, it's very good for payments. It's very good for authentication as well. It just, it works very well with, uh, uh, by creating authentication systems uh, and LNURL. As you could do, you could do it other ways with Lightning, but just uh, LNURL allows you to, to create authentication systems with your Lightning node uh, very easily. So that's pretty cool too. Yeah, that as well. And I'm very curious how Bolt 12 will play out with this because these new offers do a lot of the features that LNURL kind of hackily did in a separate server. Uh, Bolt 12 does it nicely inside the Lightning net Network just with the gossip of nodes, which is very interesting. Um, I I wonder, and especially, you know, as as we've seen with with Segwit, for example, it just took forever for a standard to be adopted by the majority of, of the network, and we're still not there. Uh, let's see how it goes with Taproot. I, I, but I mean, of course, that's on-chain, you know, address types. But what do you think how it will play out on the Lightning Network invoicing scheme? Like, will we just splinter off in way too many options that users could choose from? That's a very good question. And it's one that I've been, we've been asking ourselves a lot lately, you know, because there's, uh, there's, this is, and this is what I really like about Lightning, like in uh, differently from Bitcoin, like because there's no like shared consensus or like there's no at least synchronized shared consensus state on Lightning, you know, uh, or, and, like nodes can have different rules. Uh, there's just multiple ways to do it and, and people don't need to ask for permission that much. They can, you know, the LNURL people that have just developed a bunch of things at the same time people are, uh, have used KeySend uh, or develop Bolt 12, you know, so there's different ways in, to do the, the same thing, basically, um, that you, you, and you see that way more in Lightning than on Bitcoin. Uh, I think over time, uh, it, it really, it really depends on, on the, on the problem fixing, you know, each solution has, like if LNURL, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to go fully away. Like, I, I think it's, it's good enough. Uh, for some users to use it uh, and other users to, to, to use other tools with, uh, with Bolt 12. Unless, you know, Bolt 12 really has an incremental, you know, uh, it's, it's just incrementally better than, than LNURL. Uh, but if it's just a small changes, small improvements, uh, or just it, it's because it's naturally within the protocol, uh, then I'm not sure it, it would uh, it would take over, you know. So I, I do think that uh, we're just going to see a bunch of different um, tools being used, you know, uh, and different ways to, to achieve goals uh, on, the, on the Lightning Network rather than converge towards just one method. 
Will Lightning Network also be integrated to, to bills or ways to sell Bitcoin? That's a very good question. So, yeah, it will. Uh, it will be done at the same time. Uh, however, it's not going to be done with LNURL. Uh, it's just going to be done with uh, Bolt 11. So, at least to start with, uh, we're just going to provide a Bolt 11 invoice and uh, with the amount within it already and, and you know, the expiry uh, time and everything. Uh, so people can just copy the or scan a QR code, and because the selling is is much easier on the user experience side with Vault Eleven, you just scan a QR code, right? Uh, it's it's like paying a Bitcoin address. Um, so and and like yeah, there's the expiry uh, uh, situation where it just it, it's gonna expire, and if uh, if you don't do it co like within the right time frame, uh, it's not gonna work. But uh, in our in in our experience uh, in our tests so far, it seems to have worked well. Also, LNURL was much harder to implement. On this side, I don't, I'm not so sure why, be, uh, because I'm not the, the one developing it. Uh, but the conclusion was that we're just gonna like launch the cell side with Vault 11 uh, on Lightning at the same time. Uh, and what's really interesting about both Bitcoin cell feature is that it's uh, it's unique in the world in the sense that you can pay directly a bill uh, instead of paying the same funds to a bank account, you can directly pay a biller. So you can pay like your hydroelectricity bill or your MasterCard bill if you have credit card or your, uh, some, your mortgage uh, or any sorts of bills people have to pay. Uh, they, can, they can just do it directly from Bull Bitcoin. Uh, they can send us sats, and we're gonna pay that biller in their name uh, with in in like one to two days after. So so it's pretty uh, interesting to to have that service. Also, uh, Bull Bitcoin allows you to send money to another uh, someone else's bank account. So this is a very unique feature once again uh, because uh, usually uh, exchanges limit themselves to just allowing to withdraw funds to your bank account, uh, but we allow you to pay a biller or to send it to anybody else's bank account. Uh, well, why is Bull Bitcoin so unique in offering that service? Because it's so useful. It is very unique and it's very useful. Um, that was actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that was actually the first acquisition Bull Bitcoin did. Uh, so Bull Bitcoin has now acquired Verify as of uh, Monday of this week, but in 2015 or 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bills was acquired by Bull Bitcoin. Uh, well, at that moment, it was called Satoshi Portal. Uh, it was acquired in 2016, and that payment service was founded in 2013. So uh, I guess it's that's kind of like genius of Francis, you know, spotting those opportunities uh, and, and building on top of them. Uh, and and that's what he did with bills, uh, and just you know uh, has he has optimized it ever since. But he has helped a lot of uh, customers are very you know uh, very lo loyal to the bill service since it's it's very unique. Uh, people have have always come to 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 they've always stayed with it. And why don't others develop it? I don't know. I guess it's it's hard to set up, and a lot of people just tell themselves. Hey, I'm I'm good enough with just making regular sales, regular allowing people to just pull it back to the bank account. Or also, you got to keep in mind that most of the competition is um, is our custodial exchanges, and custodial exchanges they don't really want you to pull your money back into your bank account. They want you to sell Bitcoin, leave the Canadian dollars there uh, to buy some Bitcoin later or to buy some shit coins later. You know. Uh, so they don't really want you to, to they, they want to keep your money, right? That's, uh, that's their incentive. It's, it's to be custodial. Uh, and, and that's the big difference. We, we don't want to hold your funds at all. <laughs> we don't want to hold your Canadian dollars or your Bitcoin. Never, you know, we, we just want you, uh, to, to have control over them. Yeah, bull, bull Bitcoin strictly holding their own money is a good move for sure.
And I, I wonder also about uh, Lightning Network channel liquidity management. Uh, do you have any insights about that one? Well, you know, I think those insights are going to come when we have it on production, ready with users, you know. Right now, we've tested on testnet. We've tested. We've made a few tests ourselves. But really, I think that you'll you really learn the most of it once you, you start engaging with real life users. And when, when you know, the, when the real user stories come around. Uh, so I, I would say that so far we've been using C Lightning and uh, we've been, we have like a, a bunch of scripts that help us rebalancing uh, funds or just doing simple, you know, Lightning tasks. Uh, that we, we can run, you know, on, on occasion. So far, we've done just so manually. Uh, but maybe over time, we'll, we'll figure out ways to automate them, you know, uh, or to just uh, run them uh, on, a, on a Chrome basis, like uh, every day or every month, uh, things like that, you know. But for now, like I said, we have to launch, we have to talk to the users, and that's when we'll figure out really what uh, what the best way to deal with channel management is. Yeah, so much to learn. Uh, I'm really curious for that user feedback as well. And I wonder, because you already take the cost of the on-chain transaction fee, and that's why you're incentivized to take good care of, of making it as efficient as possible. But now with Lightning, you can be even more efficient. Right? And that means in your incentive structure that that benefit goes all to you. Uh, in a sense of you already carry all the cost and now you carry less cost. But that doesn't necessarily incentivize the user to use the latest lightning tech or liquid tech. Or do you think that there are some adequate other incentive structures to get the users uh, to use more efficient layer two tech? That's a very good question, you know. Uh, so I, I guess like any business, um, you over time, you pass on that those savings to the customer. At least any honest business, you pass on, on in a competitive market, right? Because it's it is a very competitive market. If you're just keeping on to the savings for yourself for your own business and not passing them to the user, um, competition is going to come around and, and and win win over you. So, and, and I'm a big believer in competition and, uh, and markets that operate in, in that fashion. You know, so. Uh, I think over time we'll be passing more and more savings to the users, uh, and and that will incentivize them. We we're not launching with lower fees for Lightning, but we will. We're planning to add them later, uh, so that's going to be a big incentive. Uh, but just the, the the fact that people, what, like like this was uh, Wednesday when I was having the conference. This, that was Lightning Day. Um, and just when I was, you know, talking about lightning and explaining how it works, it didn't really click on people's head, head how it worked. But when I got everyone installing wallets and sending them sats and them sending them sats between themselves and everything happened instantly and so easily, that's when people, you know, they, they understand the benefit and, and you can see the spark in their eyes. And uh, so, so it's such a much better experience to have instantly settle coins on lightning send to your wallet you can spend them you can do what you want rather than wait for the the, the bitcoin uh, transaction uh, to settle on the on on the on-chain layer and you know right now the fees are pretty low on the on the on-chain network uh, but they're gonna grow uh, and particularly on the sell side when the user is sending us bitcoins uh, and they're the ones paying on, in the fees well, I think it's pretty fast that they'll realize that Lightning is way more interesting than just regular Bitcoin because uh, of the speed and because of uh, uh, the, the the low fees it, it has, you know. So I think it's a bit of all that, but we, we'll see, you know. We're, we're still very early days uh, with Lightning, particularly with a ca Canadian audience, you know. Uh, like, it's, it's we're not in El Salvador, we're where people uh, are really adopting Lightning. Uh, where in Canada, it's, it's much lower. People are just mostly holding. Uh, but that, that's going to change over the, the next years, I think, uh, when we switch to a, to a Bitcoin economy. So uh, we'll see by then. But like I told you, uh, we'll pass on the same to our customers. Uh, that's for sure. 
you know, the reckless days of lightning were in 2017 and such. So you're very, very late to the party in some sense of the <laughs> word. But but of course, it's still so recklessly early. Uh, and good to have yet another nice exchange offering lightning services. That's awesome. Uh, but you, you also do support Liquid. Uh, and I'm wondering, like, what's the difference between lightning and Liquid, in your opinion? So... It it depends. Huh? We first of all, I'm gonna say we we support liquid in in different ways. So the first way we support liquid is uh, like someone can purchase LBTC rather than than Bitcoin on the on the on chain layer, and they can purchase it on the liquid network. Uh, but we also have created a liquid asset, which is called Liquid CAD, so Canadian dollar uh, payment on the liquid sidechain. And uh, that's basically what we use for allowing our users to withdraw their Canadian dollar balance, you know, rather than uh, then sending it, rather than them keeping the dollars on the platform or sending them back to their bank account, we allow them to send it to the green wallet or other uh, liquid network wallets, uh, and they can send LCAT to that wallet and they can keep, you know, their Canadian dollars and LCAT, and we're gonna accept the LCAT you know, for, for forever. So so they can always deposit LCAT to the platform and buy Bitcoin with it. Once it's deposited, it's, it just appears as Canadian dollars, you know, because it's this, it's just a representation of Canadian dollars on the liquid sidechain. So those are the two ways we support liquid, with LBTC, but with LCAT too. So I guess the difference, and you know, it's funny you, you talk about that because today I actually did a, a presentation on liquid uh, with uh, with the audience here, and like the the question was always like, what are the use cases for liquid? So I'd say um, versus lightning, that was that question did come up. Uh, and to me, the difference is that liquid, it's initially it was for like large organizations, right? It was for inter exchange uh, settlements between uh, um, exchanges or payment processors. Uh, for them to settle in a minute rather than 10 or 30, uh, for them to uh, do it uh, with confidential transactions and hide the amounts, um, and to do it in a, you know, uh, without reorganization of blocks. In Bitcoin, we have mining, so there's no final settlement at one block, one confirmation. In Liquid, there pretty much is final settlement once you reach one block because uh, the, the other functionaries that add new blocks, they're not gonna build a new chain. So that's that was the initial feature of Liquid, but I'd say today it has expanded uh, to also include you know other type of services uh, as like asset issuers, but uh, traders and um, and uh, what I'd say confidentiality uh, people that are pursuing uh, confidential transactions as well. So I'd say in a way. Uh, liquid is is very good for privacy. Um, I, I I wouldn't recommend it over Wasabi, uh, but I could see a future where where people are, are or I could see a present where people are using uh, Liquid for for like in, as a privacy tool uh, or as a trading tool. You know, like I was talking about something that's launched that's called Tdex dot network, which is like atomic an application where people can do atomic swaps of like LCAD versus big LBTC, LCAD versus LTether, you know. So it's and, and it's, it's atomic swaps of liquid. So it's like, it's for traders, right? Uh, traders that want to do it in a, in a, in a private, in a more private, super serving way, uh, that want to exchange stable coins versus Bitcoin uh, in a more private, super serving way, um, or, or in a, by hiding the amounts and the asset types, or doing it with atomic swaps, so in a more trustless way than on a centralized exchange, no KYC, things like that. So I'd say that's liquid, you know, for traders and, and as a privacy tool uh, and for large organizations. And I'd say Lightning is just for everyone. Uh, I'm not a trader. Uh, I use privacy tools, but I'm okay with Wasabi. Um, but if I want to spend some sats in the future, which, which I will at some point, uh, I'm going to use Lightning. And that's what people have been using and are using in El Salvador or other countries uh, where they're already, uh, you know, living, living day by day, you know, they're, they're not 
thinking about storing wealth for the long term. They're just thinking about using electronic money that's uh, uncensorable and, uh, you know, they, they can exchange b without asking for permission. So um, that's really what Lightning is. Uh, and that's where I don't think Liquid will, will, will is for. I think Liquid is, is for enterprise organizations, uh, traders, and, and uh, as a privacy tool. It, it can, we'll see, you know, we don't, we haven't seen the full extent of any of these tools. Uh, we probably haven't even seen the, 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 we have barely seen just the start. Uh, but for now, it seems like that's where they differ. And it's funny that, uh, you know, Liquid is yet another implementation of these awesome crypto magic tools like confidential transactions and the Patterson commitments and all of that. Uh, as, of course, Monero has as well. But as an unknown fact, Wabi Sabi uses as well Patterson commitments in our commitment schemes. Uh, and that ensures the uh, double spend protection, so to say, or, or at least the inflation protection inside a coin join transaction uh, off chain in the negotiation. So it, it, this is a very heavily or a frequently used concept. And it's, it's super useful, not just for Liquid or, or for Monero, but even for layer one uh, coin join coordination protocols. Ah, yeah, I didn't know that. That's really cool. And a, a couple other nu nuances like this really make Liquid very interesting and, and private. Um, but I would like to go a bit deeper into the LCAT uh, because this is a pretty genius uh, like concept that you developed here uh, on how to create a, a stable Canadian dollar value as, as a company. Yeah, for sure. Well, this is all, you know, out of Francis Puglia's brain. You know, he's the... Uh, He's the mastermind and, and, and the, the CEO of Bull Bitcoin, and we're, we're all operating under, under his leadership, uh, which we believe in, in fully. But the Liquid CAD uh, project is, is, is not exactly as... Um, it's, we, don't, we don't like to define it as a stable coin because uh, it's not uh, meant to be uh, on every trading platform. Uh, but it's, it's more like a non, it's a non-custodial prepaid payment system, you know, denominated in, in Canadian dollars. So it's, uh, it's a payment, sy uh, payment system in the sense that we at Bull Bitcoin and I think Aqua Now, uh, which is a liquidity provider, we accept it uh, in exchange of Bitcoin. And we're always going to accept LCAD as a, as a voucher um, for people to buy Bitcoin. So it's uh, and and we're the bull Bitcoin is is the usual of that. So it's kind of like debt we we have you know because people have deposited funds on our bank account in Canadian dollars and Liquid Cat is a representation of those funds uh, within a sidechain network within the Liquid network uh, and they at any moment they can come back uh, and they can they can deposit the L Cat from the green wallet. Uh, and they can get uh, those dollars, that voucher redeemed in dollars, and immediately purchase Bitcoin with it. So that's really the 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 key uh, here. It's that it's not a stable coin. It's just uh, like a prepaid card, you know. And and we've used uh, like Bitcoin tool to, for for that, you know. Uh, so so I think it's pretty good uh, what we've done there. Uh, it, the fact that also it offers confidential transactions is, is pretty privacy preserving for, for uh, even though it's a, like it's on a blockchain, even as, like a sidechain network, uh, the fact that it uses confidential transactions hides the amount. It also hides the asset type. Uh, so when you're receiving liquid CAD to your green wallet, no one knows uh, that it's liquid CAD or no one knows the amount you've withdrawn. So... I think that's pretty cool. Um, and it can also, uh, initially also, I, I, I like to add that it was about um, on, onboarding new users that, um, or like that, or users that left their, their dollars in um, on the platform for a long time. We don't want to hold their dollars on the platform. So it's like, how can we give them back their dollars if they're leaving them for too many months, you know? 
Uh, one way was sending the funds back to their bank account. But for that, we have to get their bank account information. Uh, there's communication. It's, it's, it's much trickier than just them sending us a green wallet liquid address and us sending the liquid cat to that address. So that's basically that solution to that problem, as well as many others that I mentioned. Yeah, really genius. And that helps a lot on, on the UX side and keeping it as much non-custodial uh, as is reasonable. Uh, and of course, holding your liquid uh, cat debt certificate, so to say, or gift card uh, on your own keys uh, is is nice. You know, that's that's a good benefit. Uh, and yeah, solved a lot, a, a lot of problems for, for full Bitcoin in the short term. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, it's it's not the most used feature, but it's available for for anyone that wants to use it. Uh, of course, uh, that's that's just a, an extra feature. You know, the, the the real magic is is in acquiring sats. You know, that's uh, that's what we want people to do, and just just another way for to give flexibility to the user that wants to uh, buy some sats. Yeah, that's that's very true. So considering all of the things that, that you've been working on uh, here, it's, it's a really holistic approach. What are some of the future aspects of Bitcoin that excite you? Future aspects of Bitcoin that excite me? Wow, that's, uh, that's a big question, you know. And it's funny because uh, we've had like five days of conference already and each day I've, uh, I've had a favorite topic. Each day I was like, no, nah, this is what interests me the most. Uh, I'd, I'd have to say if, if I was going to pick uh, a few, um, of course, Wasabi 2.0 is something that excites me a lot. I think it has the potential to, you know, be uh, a default, uh, almost like a default protocol for wallets uh, to have just privacy by default. Um, and like, like you said, it's going to be available on, on other wallets than just Wasabi. So I think that's pretty sick. And, and the fact that you'll be able to, to at least technically use it with hardware wallets, and obviously eventually it's going to come around, that just blows my mind too, you know? So uh, I'd say new privacy tools like Wasabi 2.0, uh, hardware wallet integration with Wasabi, with CoinJoin tools, with privacy tools, uh, with Lightning, I'd really like to see that. And I think we're not that far away from it. From, from uh, this, there was a... Um, Presentation by Paul from Sphinx.chat. Uh, he's also running Stack Work. Uh, he's actually he presented on Sphinx, which is uh, very very exciting um, and very cool. And and I I'm pretty sure this podcast is on Sphinx, right? Part of the the podcast 2.0. Yes, for sure. Even got a Sphinx stripe uh, set up, even though not not that much usage, <laughs> but still, sets are flying in every day. Nice. Well, that's great. Exactly. So that really excites me too. And what I was going to say is that Paul not only showed us how Stack Work works. You know, I've heard real life stories about Stack Work, which is a platform where people can just, without authentication, without identification, they can find tasks for stats. It can be not too many stats, but it can be quick tasks. Uh, and I've heard real life stories of like very... Uh, underprivileged individuals in very poor countries using stack work just because they had an internet connection and they could read they were able to get sats and these are people that thought they would never get a job you know in countries where let's say they were women and and they were fleeing uh conditions where they say their husbands uh, were beating them up you know and and they didn't have any financial sovereignty um and they they had this job online that would allow them to get sats without identifying without asking for permission, you know? And it was, for, for them, it's just like, wow, like, this is possible. I can, I can have a job. <laughs> so, so that, not only he, he's running stack where he can allow in tens of thousands of people to do that, he, not only is he doing Sphinx uh, as a chat application that's uncensorable and, uh, and encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, and now allows you to stream podcasting, receive sats, build communities, uh, but he's also shown us a hardware device that he's developing 
um, and it's it's you, anybody can see it on the live stream. Uh, it's that right now it's not just a video on YouTube. And um, basically, the the way he he explained it is that now Lightning you can separate the signer from the node capabilities with the Rust uh, Lightning libraries. Um, it's possible to separate the signer. So, and it's possible to put that signer into a physical device. So it's, it's, it's basically a lightning hardware wallet, you know? And over time, he thinks it's going to be possible to have not only the signer, but a really a lightning node within a hardware device that's very uh, cheap and just can be, you can have all these devices anywhere. Like you can have a lightning node on any electronical device. Uh, on any car, on any uh, parking meter or whatever, you know. He was giving examples about that. But anyways, um, Wabzabi, Wabzabi 2.0, Lightning, um, hardware wallets, uh, hardware wallet integration with, coin, with privacy tools like, like Wabzabi 2.0, uh, I guess those are the things that excite me the most. I and today there was RGB, uh, like I said, my Dr. Orlovsky presented RGB, and that was very interesting too. Although, of course, it was very hard to grasp, uh, but it was very interesting too to think about all the potential it has at Blind Blog. Yeah, so many things to be excited about. What do you think about Taproot? Taproot is, is, is really cool. I, to be honest, I, I used to be, I guess, ever since Taproot has been uh, like uh, accepted a uh, part of the of the future uh, of the bitcoin network and I'm, I'm kind of like i'm like ah oh, like success uh, what's next uh, but i should actually circle back to taproot uh, because i was actually very interested in, in testing uh, the capabilities of of uh, of uh, Schnorr signatures and uh, the, the scripts you can write with taproot um, but and i think there's a lot of potential it just has to be, you know, but we're like SegWit, it's, it's going to move quite slowly, you know, like Taproot is in. Uh, I think Bitcoin Core has Taproot support, so you're going to be able to use uh, Bitcoin Core with Taproot, but I'm not, I don't think any other wallet really has Taproot support yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to pretend to be a, a protocol developer, you know, I'm, I'm not. Uh, so maybe it's, I'm not ready to fully test Taproot to its extent. But, you know, I think in a couple of months, when it's going to be out there in wallets, uh, in development software, you know, in libraries, uh, way, way more supported than it is now, which it is at least a bit. Uh, that's the moment when we'll figure out really the, the extent uh, to this. But migration takes a while as well. You know, we saw with SegWit, uh, it took many years for half of the network to move on to SegWit. I, I predict the similar thing is going to happen with Taproot. Uh, so at, maybe at first it's not that interesting when you're the only one using it, right? But when half of the network is using Taproot, I think that's when it's going to get really interesting, you know, when we're going to see like uh, uh, Snore transactions uh, that basically multisig, well, excuse me, this is how are we, we don't name it multisig, we name it uh, differently when it comes to Snore. Uh, but yeah, Musig, exactly. Uh, so when we see Musig being used, um, and, and you can have like off-chain uh, multi-sig uh, threshold signature transactions, uh, and you can have a lot of parties, and you you wouldn't be able to test tell the difference between that and an unrealized script that which has like ten conditions uh, or like a Lightning Network opening channel. Uh, just you can have so many different things looking the same at start, you know. Uh, and having a lot of conditions never revealed. You know, because so far in Bitcoin, unless like, okay, the pay to script transactions that haven't been consumed, they're not revealed, but they're not consumed, right? Um, with, with Taproot, you're going to consume scripts and you're going to hide the con conditions you haven't executed. So that's going to create like uh, just, you know, questions until eternity. Like what were those conditions that <laughs> were never revealed? Um, so I think that's going to be really interesting, but like I said, we still got a lot of time to go. Yeah, again, very much future talk. But even things like Bolt 12 offers, 
uh, for the lightning spec uh, do work really well with Shinor signatures uh, and, you know, also Wabi Sabi and Wasabi 2.0 will, will hopefully soon, <laughs> it's not yet implemented, but hopefully soon uh, uh, when Taproot is, is activated, uh, supported. But yeah, there come in so many trade-offs. As you say, there is again the, uh, the the anonymity set size, the size of the crowd of people using Taproot. And that was the reason why Wasabi was... Wasabi 1.0 was sec with single public key native uh, since the beginning and, and exclusively. Right? You cannot even create a legacy or rep sec with uh, address uh, just because if some Wasabi users use that address type and some use the other, then that's a potential privacy leak. And I'm curious how we're going to play this out in, in Wasabi 2.0 because... Yes, that's a big argument, but on the other hand, it, it does limit the the user size at first drastically, and I'm not sure when the right choice for that trade-off is. That's a very good question you, you're asking there. Huh? It's um, but you know, I would ha I would say it's it's hard to say really because both could be argued as good answers, you know, and also. Um, like it turned out pretty well, the, the fact that you guys use Sacred Native on, on Wasabi 1.0, but you, you didn't have as many users at, at that moment. Uh, now you have a lot of users, and uh, as soon as you release Wasabi 2.0, a lot of people are going to use it. So it's hard to say uh, which is the best strategy huh? um, now that you have so many users, and it's, it's just a clear different condition than uh, when you were first starting. But sometimes it seems like the best approach is the, you know, the courageous one. And maybe uh, it'd be better to just uh, release with uh, pay to tap root addresses and on to the next, uh, on to the next era, you know? Yeah, that's true. But, and again, right, the, the music benefits in Schnorr signatures would mean that multi six looks indistinguishable from single sig, And that, at least in theory, enables the private consolidation of multi-sig and non-multi-sig and lightning channels um, in a way that is not obvious on chain, at least in the script level. Uh, but again, this, you know, this sounds so beautiful in theory, but then you try to implement the nuances of it and it's a shit show and communication always breaks down and, you know, coordinating stuff among 100 peers, especially if there's like, you know, five out of seven threshold uh, represented by one peer. That, uh, I don't know, but it's it just seems super complicated. So I'm, I'm very curious if and when we will get to that point. It is, you're, you're right. It's, it's very complicated. It opens so many doors, you know, because uh, Taproot is, uh, some people don't know, but Taproot is many, this Taproot upgrade is many things. Uh, at the same time, you know, as as much it is, as it is, uh, just uh, music is also, uh, well, taproot, which is kind of like uh, many conditions and uh, that some some are not revealed, you know. So, so it's many things at the same, and it's just not just snow signatures. It's music, and it's a new address type, of course, right? And there's other things um, that that can can come later or or even. That can be done like um, uh, adapt your signatures. I'm pretty sure it can it can be it can already be done or or some t some other forms of scriptless scripts, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely very complicated. Opens a lot of doors. So so yeah, I understand. It, it might make sense to be more cautious than not. It's Segwit didn't open as many doors, I think. Yeah, we'll see. Also, one thing to consider is that with Segwit there was a direct fee discount. Right, for for using native Sequit uh, in in any case, right? And in Taproot, if you would compare a native Sequit single sig to a Taproot single sig, uh, then Taproot is actually slightly more expensive because of uncompressed public keys directly in the address. Um, ho however, as soon as we go into the more complex Bitcoin script usages like multi signatures uh, or hash time lock contracts and just nuanced multi-stage logical tree or if if else conditions you know all of that can be now done massively more efficient 
And this is where we will see the, the real benefits. And I wonder if that would mean that maybe individuals who just have their own single SIG wallet might not care that much, but then again, exchanges and large high volume transaction makers with complex scripts and custody arrangements uh, will see not just a usability, but also a financial uh, benefit to it. Mm. That's true. Um, there's a lot of questions there, you know, and, and I don't think it's going to stop with Taproot, but that's the thing, you know, it's, it's, this, this is going to get trickier and trickier as time goes by, you know, particularly if we get like uh, other, other protocols within the, I think it's BIP 118 that's uh, also close to being proposed, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so there, there's a lot of, of, of stuff uh, that, that's, that's going to come quite soon, you know, that's going to just make it way, that, that, that's going to push this question in, in that direction way more, you know. Uh, people are working on covenants or, or vaults uh, or think, things in, in that direction. Um, yeah, this this question is probably just getting started, you know, and we'll we'll have to deal with that more and more. Yeah, well, eventually there might be Wabi Sabi coin join rounds that have uh, signing phases of multiple days uh, just to arrange for your inter international multi location uh, time delayed signing and retrieving process uh, to be played out in a in a massive coin join among hundreds of users. Yeah. Uh, soon in two weeks. Stay tuned. <laughs> that would be cool. Wow. Yeah, but but lots of things still to explore. Uh, Gustavo, are there any other topics that uh, you are you're, you deem necessary uh, to share here among the peers? Mm, well, maybe I can talk a little bit about uh, basically a, a few things that I have uh, not addressed yet regarding this week. Uh, so I've, I've talked about the conference, I've talked about the acquisition from Bobay Coin to Verify, but uh, we're not killing off the brand Verify. We, we're we're going to keep it, and actually we launched a new website. Uh, on the same day we announced the acquisition and we started the conference, we launched a new website of Verify. It's uh, way clearer. It has a lot of information about Bitcoin, about uh, the security overview of Bitcoin, uh, like the custody, different custody options people can use, not using our services, but just they can use as, as regular Bitcoin users, you know, uh, hardware wallets, multi-sig, running a node. So, so it has all the, 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 the educational information. But also what I wanted to say is uh, we've launched a new brand and uh, it's, it's a different color. It's kind of like a, a brownish green uh, and it, it's also a different logo. Um, and yeah, we, we, so I, I, uh, everyone who wants to learn more about Verify can go and, and see our new website, our, our new logo. Uh, we, we think it matches way more with our mission, you know, which is about like educating users and like, um, adopting self custody. And, uh, but also there's a lot of information, you know, uh, people can find to, to help themselves on, on our website or on our blog. Uh, our blog has a lot of information. Um, and if you if you're French as well, if you're French speaking, uh, you you can uh, you you will really enjoy our website as well because it has a lot of French content. And also, we've launched content in Spanish, so uh, we've tra translated our whole blog, uh, our whole website in Spanish. So uh, we uh, that's also. Uh, available for, for, for peers that speak f sp Spanish or French. Uh, but like I said, our, our blog is probably the, the most advanced education effort we, we've had. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll continue those efforts. You know, we, we're really here on a mission of uh, not only selling Bitcoin uh, and providing Bitcoin services, but uh, creating, uh, you know, free content uh, and open source software to, to push on the mission. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, Bull Bitcoin is, of course, a Canadian company, and you guys are from Montreal, also Canada. But how is your international presence for the consulting services, which, you know, at least in theory, should work for anyone? Well, that's a very good question. And um, so far, we, as, as Verify, have 
been bootstrapping for two years and we had limited resources, we really hadn't explored like a marketing international strategy because the first step is is, is people knowing about you, right? And that's uh, and that's kind of our, our goal now, just uh, getting it known by the most number of people uh, and maybe even people that don't need our service, you know, uh, but they will recommend it to their friends and their family when the moment comes, you know. Um, so, so yeah, so far we our, our international strategy has been limited, although it it has uh, been available. Uh, but but now we're really gonna focus on, on uh, making it uh, internationally available. Uh, probably we'll start with like North America uh, because of the shipping uh, question. You know, there's sometimes material to ship, so. Uh, it can get trickier uh, to to do internationally, but it's it's doable. So uh, we're gonna have that. Uh, we, it's already it's ready, so be, anybody can 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 order it already. But I mean, we're gonna keep on making it uh, more accessible, uh, more known by, and just uh, you know talk about it more, add more content, add more services, uh, improve our services uh, for the international community more and more. You know, like because. And and we really enjoy the fact that, uh, and not only Verify, but Bull Bitcoin as a whole, that, um, you know, these these services, these are not financial services. We don't need your, your private information for this. We can, you can just hire us without telling us your name, uh, without any real information, uh, which is very different from a financial service in Bull Bitcoin, where we have no choice but to get private information because that's that's just how the law works uh so we're really excited about these suite of self-custody support services because they're not financial services we can expand them internationally with very little regulation and we can offer them in a privacy preserving manner uh, which is just great yeah that's awesome and on that note any insights on when bull bitcoin goes international yeah, that's uh, that's the big question, huh? Uh, nah, unfortunately, uh, we still have to go through. We still have to think all that, you know. Um, it's it's not. There's really no uh, target for that or a strategy that's clear for that. Um, but we we're thinking it's obviously something that has crossed our minds, you know. Uh, and we'll we we'll keep on exploring that that option uh, because, of course, you know, bull Bitcoin. Is, is is unique in its feature set, uh, and Canadians have, uh, like you said uh, during your your presentation on Monday uh, or your, your your talk on Monday, uh, like you said, you're like, ah, you guys want to leave Canada because uh, uh, it has a lot of uh, tyranny, but at the same time, it offers more Bitcoin, so it's like you get some bad, you get some good, right? Uh, so we'll see. Nothing clear yet. Yeah, so lots of uncertainty, but you're on a great stellar path and it's really going well for you. And that's awesome. Uh, so don't change your winning system or, well, uh, don't make bad changes. You're making a lot of changes, but so far they're all good. Uh, so that's that's a good track record. Thank you, Max. I appreciate it. Awesome. So any final words from your side? Yeah, well, I'd say uh, that... Well, I thank you, Max, and uh, the, the everyone uh, running this podcast for for having me. Uh, you know, and uh, it's it's really for us. This this was a big week. Uh, we had everything from the acquisition to the new brand uh, launch to the conference, and we have one more day to go, uh, which is tomorrow. We're going to have like a big barbecue, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. And after that, uh, we're back to work uh, in a very intense manner. So expect a lot of things from Bull Bitcoin over the next six to twelve months. Uh, we're, we we're just getting started. Awesome. Well, uh, you've done an awesome amount of work with spreading the Bitcoin propaganda in Montreal and Canada, and it really shows. And I think uh, Bull Bitcoin is one of the many awesome companies that has emerged out of that tribe of people and uh, verify of course another uh, that is extremely helpful and a very useful service that customers can now have the privilege of using 
Uh, and of course, in exchange for the precious sats that these rock star entrepreneurs have very much deserved. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, keep up the amazing work and uh, continue being as as reckless and as principled uh, as you are. Uh, it it really is is a fun and a joy to see what other cool tech you come up with and how you continue to sharpen the narrative of how to use this technology. Uh, and uh, hopefully, from from our side, we'll make sure that. Wasabi 2.0 will be as beautiful as we hope it to be, so that it's as useful uh, for you in, in all the crazy things. Uh, but until then, Piers, I'm really looking forward to our next conversations. And until that one, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Max. Yeah.